Ellington, resuming debate. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. While it's always indeed an honour and a privilege to rise in this House and address this House on important matters, it was some disappointment that we find ourselves once again in this place debating a question of privilege. I've frankly lost count of the number of times in this Parliament and in recent Parliaments that this House has had to debate questions of privilege related to the actions of this Liberal government. Now, this particular question of privilege, though, is very serious. And it relates to the government's failure to produce the documents that were required to be produced by an order of this House. On June 10th of this year, a majority of members in this House passed a motion that ordered the production of important documents related to Sustainable Development Technology Canada, SDTC. And these documents were to be deposited with the law clerk, who would then have them forwarded to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The key word, Madam Speaker, is order. This was not an ask. It was not a request. It was not a pretty please, if you have time, would you be so kind as to provide this information. It was an order of this House. An order of this House that has great constitutional and legal weight. To talk about this, we need to go back and look at the principles of the privileges of this House. The House of Commons has the authority to order the production of documents, and that order and that, or that authority comes from our Constitution. Section 18 of the British North America Act, now known as the Constitution Act 1867, states, quote, the privileges, immunities, and powers to be held, enjoyed, and exercised by the Senate and by the House of Commons, and by the members thereof, respectively, shall be such as are from time to time defined by the Act of the Parliament of Canada." End quote. That power includes the time-honoured ability to send for persons, papers and records. As is explained in Bosque and Gagnon at pages 984 and 985, quote, the standing orders do not delimit the power to order the production of papers and records. The result is a broad, absolute power that on the surface appears to be without restriction. There is no limit to the types of papers likely to be requested. The only prerequisite is that the papers exist in hard copy or electric fo electronic format, and they are located within Canada." End quote. Very clearly, the documents requested in this case qualify under those provisions. Boskin Gagnon goes on to state, quote, no statute or practice diminishes the fullness of that power rooted in House privileges unless there is an explicit legal provision to that effect, or unless the House adopts a specific resolution limiting the power of the House, limiting the power. The House has never set a limit on its power to order the production of papers and records. Now, Madam Speaker, I know all members have their preferred authorities, their favourite uh, green books. Mine, of course, is Beauchene's Parliamentary Pr Rules and Forms. 6th edition, which, citing again Erskine, May and others, states as, follow, as follows at uh, paragraph 24 for those following along at home, quote, parliamentary privilege is the sum of the peculiar rights enjoyed by each house collectively as a constituent, a constituent part of the High Court of Parliament and by members of each house individually without which they cannot discharge their functions and which exceed those possessed by other bodies or individuals. Thus, privilege, though part of the law of the land, is to a certain extent an exception from the ordinary law. The distinctive mark of a privilege is its ancillary character. The privileges of Parliament are rights which are absolutely necessary for the due execution of its powers. Madam Speaker, I remind the House that absolutely necessary for the execution of the powers of this House. Our right as the House of Commons is to order the production of documents. We are the grand inquest of the nation. Documents have been ordered by this House. Those documents were not provided as stipulated by that order. And that, Madam Speaker, is why we're here today on this question of privilege. Now let's take a step back and look at some of the issues involved with SDTC. 
It has become known as the Green Slush Fund for obvious reasons. The Office of the Auditor General made key, several key observation, observations during the audit period, which go from March 2017 to December 2023. I want to include a few key points from that report, which was tabled in this House on June 4th of this year. First, 10 projects were approved for more than $59 million for funding, which should have been deemed ineligible. $59 million went to ineligible recipients. Second point I want to focus on, SDTC's conflict of interest policies were not followed 90 times. 90 times this organization failed to follow its own conflict of interest policies. Third, the board approved $58 million for projects without ensuring that they met the terms of the contribution agreements. Now, at the same time, Madam Speaker, the government's responses to these issues could be summarized in one word, pathetic. In all the responses that I've seen in relation to the Auditor General's reports, I, cannot see, I, I, I can't say that I've ever seen such absurd responses from this government. In fact, SDTC in some cases made false and outright preposterous claims. I want to highlight a few of these responses. SDTC claimed that each project proposal goes through rigorous due diligence and evaluation that is, quote, robust and, quote, highly credible. Simply not true. If it were true, we would not be facing a multi-million dollar corruption scandal. And unless that due diligence they're referring to is actually simply SDTC insiders looking at who on their board is getting their money, it simply didn't happen. SDTC also claimed that they were subject to an innovation, science, and economic development evaluation. And that was in 2018, before the scandal happened. Six years ago, outside of the Auditor General's period, and outside of the period when they were clearly ignoring their audit and their findings. SDTC said that they do not fully agree with the Auditor General's recommendations because, quote, SDTC has delivered strong outcomes against these objectives. Well, unless those objectives were to push more money into companies that board members have a financial interest in, it is simply not true. In fact, the Auditor General herself found that 82%, 8 out of 10, of the funding transactions approved by the Board of Directors during the audit period were conflicted. 82% of the time that they approved funding, there were members of the Board who were benefiting from the decisions that they were approving. SDTC also wrote, quote, written records did not fully capture the robust deliberations that were made, and, quote, SDTC is of the view that these projects met the eligibility criteria set out, but acknowledges that the Auditor General reached a different conclusion. Yes, the Auditor General did reach a different conclusion. She found that money was misspent. She found that there was conflicts in 82% of the time. The corrupt operators at the Green Slush Fund is saying that the Auditor General got it wrong, but Madam Speaker, any day of the week, I'll put my money behind the Auditor General than the directors at the corrupt Green Slush Fund. SDTC also claimed that they had clear processes for staff and directors to declare real potential and perceived conflicts. Again, this claim completely ignores the findings of the Auditor General and, and, and frankly, the Public Accounts Committee, of which I'm, I'm proud to be a member. We know conflicts were not declared, and even when they were de declared, they either voted for their own projects or took turns voting for each other's projects in the same room without even exiting themselves from the room. The idea that there were clear processes for conflict of interest would be laughable if it was not so concerning that these things were happening under the watch of this current government. SDTC also claimed that they, quote, further strengthened its conflict of interest policies in November 2023, well after these allegations came to light. And more than that, it shows that they only cared about these problems after these terrible abuse and corruptions were found. Now, by November 2023, they knew the Auditor General's report was coming because that audit period was from March 2017 to December 2023. Claiming that policies have been strengthened and implying nothing further needs to be done 
after the corruption has already happened is simply disingenuous. Madam Speaker, there is a word for this kind of arrogance. Entitlement. This kind of entitlement that comes from any organization so used to getting vast amounts of money for their own projects disconnects them from the realities of honest, hard-working Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Now, Madam Speaker, as you know, this matter has been raised in at least two parliamentary committees which are doing exceptional work studying this matter, both the Public Accounts Committee and the Industry Committee. But there's still a lot we do not know about SDTC, SDTC and the Green Slush Fund. But what we have learned through the Industry and Public Accounts Committees is truly alarming. And what we have learned so far is that those of us on the opposite benches and the opposition benches are determined to find out the full story and to ensure that we need to ensure that the appropriate authorities are made aware of the documents in question. Now what's interesting, Madam Speaker, is that it's often cited that this isn't a new entity. Indeed, SDTC was created in 2001, over 20 years of its existence. But the problems didn't occur until it came under the authority of this Liberal government. In fact, in an audit in 2017, no major concerns were raised. The conflict of interest culture only emerged after board members were handpicked and appointed by the current Liberal government and then minister, Liberal Minister Navdeep Baines, who I might add is appearing tomorrow at the Public Accounts Committee. What's more is the most concerning of these appointments was in 2019 when the chair, Annette Versharen, was appointed as chair despite clear conflicts of interest on this file. Those warnings turned out to be well warranted as this past July that former chair was found, to have, was found by the Ethics Commissioner to have violated the conflict of interest and Ethics Commissioner uh, for her participation in decisions to benefit organizations that she herself had a financial interest in. And that's not me saying that. That is our Ethics Commissioner noting that she was found guilty of violating the Conflict of Interest Act. We also found out through testimony at committee that former Assistant Deputy Minister Noseworthy was responsible for keeping watch over SDTC, but apparently failed to do so. On December 11th of last year, he appeared at the Industry Committee and said, quote, to my knowledge, I am not aware of any decisions to allocate funds to projects related to board members where they did not recuse themselves. But the Auditor General's report released just two months later clearly informed us that the system was filled with conflicts of interest. Going back to that 82% number. So how ADM Noseworthy tried to claim that there was no awareness of these conflicts of interest is clearly at odds with the actual facts found in the case by the Auditor General. He either told an untruth to the committee or he was willfully blind to the corruption that was going on in the institution for which he was responsible. We also know that there was, if there was any semblance of good governance, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Technology would have or should have been notified of these lapses in conflicts of interest rules and that the fact that the accountability was absent in this matter. What's more, Madam Speaker, we found out in shocking testimony at the Public Accounts Committee that at least one Liberal MP was informed of these allegations more than two years ago. The Liberal Member of Parliament for Calgary Skyview was informed of these decisions, but perhaps his response to the matter got lost in the mail. When the whistleblower known to the committee as Witness 1 appeared at Public Accounts Committee last month, they informed us they had informed the Liberal member for Calgary Skyview in May 2022. And the whistleblower states that this Liberal member, and I quote, assured me that he took this situation seriously and guaranteed that he would facilitate contact with the appropriate people in the federal government and the Auditor General's office, end quote. However, that Liberal member was not true to his word and subsequently refused to engage. We also know that Liberal-friendly directors were appointed to the board. A key example of this is longtime Liberal operative Stephen Kuchucha, 
who was appointed to the board in February 2021. This is after he had a long time career as a Liberal donor, a ministerial staffer in a Liberal government, a regional organizer for the Liberal Party of Canada, and former secretary for the Liberals 2016 convention. Interestingly, shortly after this Prime Minister came into office, this Liberal insider became a lobbyist where he advocated for certain energy and transportation businesses. Yet, he was still appointed to the board of the SDTC, the Green Slush Fund. Exactly where companies that, which, which is exactly where the companies he had a personal financial interest in could receive financial contribution from the very same government. Furthermore, and as my good friend and colleague from South Shore St. Margaret's has very ably explained, we know also that the current Liberal Minister of the Environment has had an interest in a venture capital firm called Cycle Capital, who has also received funding from the Green Slush Fund. Finally, Madam Speaker, we know that we know now learning from a current member of the new board that since the scandal broke, none of the money, not one penny, not one dollar that has been wrongfully spent has been recovered. I want to repeat that for Canadians. Despite the fact that 82% of decisions were made by conflicted board members, not a dollar has been recouped for Canadian, document, or for Canadian uh, taxpayers. This is but one more reason why the production and the order of these papers must be fulfilled, as was ordered by a majority of this House. So, Madam Speaker, let's refresh what we are looking for. As the grand inquest of the nation, this is not only a matter of parliamentary privilege for this House, it is a moral obligation to Canadians. In order to meet that obligation, the orders for these documents must be fully provided to the parliamentary law clerk and thereby sent to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I personally sit on the Public Accounts Committee and we there are still waiting to receive a number of documents separate in part from this motion. We do not yet have the communications that would indicate if or when the Minister of Innova Innovation, Science and Industry was informed that this money was going out based on the decisions of conflicted board members. We do not yet have contribution and funding agreements showing the requirements and obligations of recipients. We do not have the conflict of interest declarations of board members and former board members. And when we put this all together, simply put, we do not have the transparency required, we do not have the oversight needed, and we do not have the accountability required that is expected of us as members of this House. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, this isn't the first question of privilege we have dealt with in recent times. But it seems that we're doing this time and time again. Earlier this year, on yet another privilege debate, on yet another scandal, that of the Arrive Can scandal, I stated that this is a slow erosion of the rights and privileges, and it is not a small matter. It is an absolute threat to a parliamentary democracy. We saw this in previous parliaments with the Winnipeg Lab scandal, which caused tremendous hardships for the scandal-plagued Liberal government. In fact, in that case, a, the President of the Public Health Agency of Canada was called to the bar to be admonished for failing, or perhaps more accurately, refusing to provide documents that had been ordered to be provided to this House. In that case, Madam Speaker, the Liberal government themselves took the Speaker of the House to court to avoid accountability. And on the same topic of withholding documents, just earlier this month, the Speaker ruled that there was another prima facie question of privilege in which the business partner of the Liberal member for Edmonton uh, Centre failed to disclose documents that he had been ordered to provide. His business partner is disregarding an order of Parliament, and we will certainly deal with that question of privilege when this one is dealt with. Madam Speaker, this isn't simply a question of niceties of respecting parliamentary privilege. This goes to the heart of our democracy. This scandal was a tremendous waste of money, where hard-earned taxpayer dollars was used to benefit government insiders by the board of SDTC. There needs to be clear and accountable records for Canadians to know that who got rich and who is at fault. Madam Speaker, we must pass this motion, but what is more and what is equally important is the documents must be 
turned over to the parliamentary law clerk as required by the order of this House. Thank you, Madam Speaker.